material from my ACS exam. For in-depth lectures, check out UC Irving's, uh, Irving's Open Courseware, especially their Chem 51 series, and for specifically Dr. David Von Bronken, he gives awesome lectures. Would that be parts of uh, redox reaction? There's reduction, reduction. And then there is blue, there is oxidation, reduction. Generally speaking, this is where we have more carbon hydrogen bonds or less carbon oxygen bonds, generally speaking and to lesser extent carbon carbon bonds oxidation do that in blue it's the exact opposite we have less carbon hydrogen bonds we have more carbon oxygen bonds and we have more carbon carbon bonds palladium on carbon I guess notes to make that are, should be made at least on this is that act with this will give us a reaction with either an alkyne or reaction with an alkene. It doesn't really care about which either one it reacts with. Um, so depending on the mechanism that we're talking about here, or depending on the substrate, whatever we're reacting with. That can totally depend on things here, but uh, I do need to make a note that it's uh, the addition here is syn hydrogen addition, and uh, because the way that it works is so you have uh, an alkane or an alkyne here, and there's this basically the surface with a bunch of little um, hydrogens on here. The palladium is carbon is going to only add to the least substituted side. So the sin here, addition, yeah, but this tends to be to the less substituted side. Mechanistically, why is that the case? Because well, there is less shit in the way. So remember, it has to add from a solid uh, perspective and standpoint. Um, one of the things to note is that this fully reduces reduces uh, uh, to an alkane. You cannot uh, isolate an alkene from an alkyne reaction. It's so rapid. It's so fast it's going to fully go through here and then one last note that I have made uh, obviously watch for stereochemical effects so this can cause an enantiomers but this doesn't work if there is a carbonyl in the molecule because if that you have that carbonyl there you get yourself a keto alcohol uh, byproduct there that's kind of reacting in equilibrium with a bit more beneficial. So that's the first thing that we need to know as far as reducing agents go. The other two reducing agents are Lindlar's and sodium um, uh, NaNH3. So Lindlar, and something that I guess these guys both have in common. So they both are reactive only with, and I'll switch colors, do it in white, alkynes. So they only react with alkynes. They react, uh, do they react with alkenes? No, so don't put that in there if you're doing a synthesis problem. So let's talk about Lindlar's catalyst. And these are all, if we're doing reducing agents, know that these are all with H2 reactions. So what does Lindlar do? Well, Lindlar, again, we have ourselves an alkyne. What do you do? When we react this with Lindlar's, I'm just going to say L, big there, 
what we end up getting is a Z configuration slash, um, you could say that it's the same thing as sys, or to be more specific, that this is a sin hydrogen addition. It doesn't tell us much about the mechanism behind it, and it doesn't tell us much about the structure of Linlar. But if we have, say, for example, a completely linear alkyne, and we treat that with Linlar L, well, then the, the product of that reaction is going to be C, C. Hopefully you can see that that is a syn addition. It's a cis, it's a Z confirmation. And I'll switch colors that we have added hydrogens from the same side. So I'm just going to reiterate that that is syn. Okay. The other, I don't know, I can use that color. I'll use white. The other one is sodium and ammonia. Liquid ammonia, that's the solvent here. So just like Linlar, these are both only reactive with alkynes. It won't do shit to an alkene. And the only difference is, whereas in Linlar it was a zis, a cis, z, and syn addition, this guy here is E slash trans configuration for your alkene, and it is a anti H addition. So what is our product going to be? We have ourselves an alkene, alkyne, sorry, here. We go ahead and react that. I'm just going to draw it down this way with sodium and NH3. It's going to be solvated, and our result is going to be a E trans uh, and anti. So this is obviously a trans alkene. Where did the hydrogens come from? Well, there's a hydrogen there. And there's a hydrogen there. Hydrogen there. Cool. Another type is lithium aluminum hydride. And uh, it, it, the book seems seemingly obsessed with this. Um, the one thing that is confusing as fuck for me to understand is that aluminum is a metalloid. But in my textbook, it mentions that this metalloid here is a negative formal charge. But then when it goes into depth of explaining the, I get the mechanism behind it, it says that this is partially positive somehow and that this hydrogen here is partially negative. Uh, I guess the only way that I can think of is that maybe this aluminum here is so unstable with having that negative charge that it's constantly reacting in equilibrium, giving me a hydride nucleophile. That would kind of make sense. Um, but you don't really need to know that so much as is the fact that it's literally kind of like a slingshot onto uh, a, a mechanism. But I, I guess the point that I'm saying is that lithium aluminum hydride gives us a SN2 hydride nucleophile attack. And so keep in mind that it's SN2. Uh, we always need, want to run this with water, uh, usually because we use this with epoxidation. That's all that I know of this reaction mechanism yet. I know I'm probably gonna learn something newer. Alright, so peroxy acids. Peroxy, anything that has a peroxide, that means it's an oxygen bound to another oxygen. But uh, let's talk about that. So peroxy acids, well, their general structure is this. Oh. 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 Kind of goofy looking uh, because of their their structure all here. The most common or the best peroxy acid to use is known as MCPBA. Structurally speaking, that is a benzene ring with a chlorine sticking out of it. The chlorine is totally inconsequential. And I'll go into the details of the mechanism for myself later. O, O, and I'm just gonna draw it like that with the H. What do we use these for? Well, I can use this to convert an alkene to an epoxide. 
Okay. Now, quick note to make on this. If I have a cis alkene with respect to other substituents, I'm going to get a cis product. If I have a cis reactant, I get a cis product. If I have a trans alkene here, I'm going to get a trans epoxide. That's, that's something that, not just with this, but with a lot of circumstances, that tends to be the case. Okay, moving on to dihydroxylation of alkenes. So when we're dihydroxylating alkenes, there's two ways that we can add these. So what we're doing is we're going from a alkene here to a alkene. I do, okay, so OH, OH. That's what we're doing, but the ways that there's two different ways that we can add things, blue. Syn addition, and then there's the anti addition. So what do we do for sin? Well, the advantage of sin addition is that it happens in one step. So one step, it's relatively speaking pretty, pretty quick. Um, there's two main reagents that I feel like I need to know for this, and that is osmium, osmium tetroxide, and I have to make sure that I specify that's a, in catalytic amounts. And NMO, that's a very efficient reaction. And then the potassium permanganate, I run that with sodium hydroxide and water. And that'll give me a syn addition of my alkene. Now the anti-addition, well, there's only really one way that I can get an anti-addition uh, for an alkene. But uh, the first thing that I want to do is... Uh, MCPBA, that MCPBA is going to give me an epoxide, and then with that epoxide, uh, I can go ahead and treat that with sodium hydroxide and water. And the advantage of this is that this hydrogen is going to attack here, and it's going to open that up, that water can come in and protonate that acid there. I, I also wanted to make a note that if and this isn't just with oxygen, this is refers to any time I have an epoxide, any time I have a three-membered ring, okay? If this substituent here has a neutral charge, then the nucleophile will always attack at the least substituted position, or the least substituted carbon. Don't forget that when you're doing this, don't forget that when you're doing lithium aluminum hydride or any uh, SN2 reaction there. Also falling along. So I have oxidation of alcohols and obviously there's primary alcohols and there is secondary alcohols. So if I have a primary alcohol I'm going to, there's, there's, there's really two products that I can get because there's two reagents that I can get. So if I want to, it depends on what I want to make with it. If I'm making with a primary alcohol and I want to make that an aldehyde, if I want to do that, I'm, uh, you know, generic structure here. If I want to make this, I'm going to treat that alcohol with the reagent known as PCC. Um, and while it's, at the book kind of implies that it's, uh, it's always there, dichloro... Uh, methane. If I want to convert a primary alcohol to a carboxylic acid, general structure, if I want to convert my primary alcohol to that, well, there's a large number of reagents I can use. The only one that I'm going to bother to remember because it's the only one that actually that the only mechanism that the book shows, although I, I've heard that that's wrong, was uh, chromate and sulfuric acid with water. That's what I have to do if I want to make a carboxylic acid. That's my reagent that I'm going to have to use there. Okay, so for a secondary alcohol, it doesn't matter because well. <laughs> These this primary alcohol, so there's you know just think about it, there's carbon and then there's an OH and that's it. Okay, the rest of these are all hydrogens, right? So for a secondary alcohol, it looks like this, right? Well, the only way that I could oxidize that would be to uh, give me only one type of product. So it doesn't matter what I do, I'm always going to get a ketone. 
So always gonna get a ketone. What gets me ketones? Well, there's two reagents, but they're gonna be the exact same. There's PCC, and I can react that with dichloromethane, and then there is uh, chromate in hydrosulfuric acid and in water. So those are the only two products that I can get from that. All right, so let's talk about cleavage reactions or ozolysis reactions. Uh, they're the same thing. Uh, there's two things that I can use. Well, there's cleavage reactions of alkenes, and depending on the structure of the alkene, then it's going to give me different products. Um, usually it's going to be either a ketone or an aldehyde. That's not really so... Well, okay, I'll go ahead and write that down. That The product is always going to be either a ketone... Well, usually ketone or an aldehyde. So what, what works here is whenever I'm drawing this, I just go ahead and wherever I draw a cleavage mark within a bond, I know that that means that I have given myself a carbonyl bond. Um, so for an example, I guess R, C, C, H, R, R. I go ahead and cleave that bond there. My products are going to be R, C, O, H, and R, C, O, R. Those are my products of this reaction. How do I get this reaction? What causes this cleavage? Well, there's two uh, reagents that I can use. The first one, it's less effective, but doesn't smell as bad, is to put zinc in with a H2O workup. Um, I'm not a fan of doing that. Uh, well, these are both, I should clarify, these are all O3 reactions, all cleavage, all ozolysis reactions are using ozone in the process here, but that's one of the, the main reagents. The other reagent that I can use, and this is the preferred uh, reagent, I guess, that I could think of it as, is uh, dimethyl sulfate. And that's that, generally speaking, tends to work more favorable than that. Okay, so cleavage of alkynes, um, green. Alkynes, obviously, well, it depends ultimately on the structures here, but what are the products that I get whenever I cleave an alkyne? Well, I usually tend to get, that's times two of a carboxylic acid. Whenever I'm doing a ozolysis reaction of that, and uh, that only, however, applies to internal alkynes. So C, 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 C. Um, obviously both of these reactions here, and I'll switch to uh, white. Both of these reactions are really just using O3 and water. So uh, I guess a note to make would be that the when you're doing a mystery retro synthetic reaction or reverse retrograde synthesis, trying to figure out what the reaction is, uh, the reagent can tell you whether or not that starting uh, reactant was an alkyne or whether it was an alkene. Okay, so internal gives us a carboxylic acid, uh, but for terminals, it's kind of interesting. It gives us, it does give us one carboxylic acid, and then the other is CO2. Um, obviously, if this was internal alkynes, this would be terminal alkynes. So what does their structure look like? Well, there's a C, 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 H right there. And the thing with these though that I need you want to make a note of is that all carbon, both the sigma bonds and both the pi bonds are broken in this reaction at once, which is kind of crazy when everything about it doesn't give me any of the details behind that mechanism. Not talking about that. All right, so now let's talk about the 
sodium and ammonia mechanism. So what this is going to give us, we're going to go from our kine to a trans alkene. So the first thing that happens is this alkyne, it's reacting in equilibrium. It is, there's another way that we can draw this alkyne. And the thing is, this structure is not really that favorable. You'd probably have to initiate some light to get this thing going. But what happens is, and I'm going to draw these as fish hook arrows to the best of my ability. It's reacting in, it's a resonance, if I can find the, all right, whatever. It's reacting in resonance to form this compound here. All right, so we have this compound here. And what we are doing when we put that sodium in the liquid ammonia, the sodium is, and I should probably clarify that that's in a zero oxidative state. So when we put sodium in liquid ammonia, it becomes solvated. It goes from here to being sodium plus, and we get an electron out of that. Now what we do with that electron I'll go ahead and draw it here. It's going to go ahead and it's going to react with that radical uh, carbon there. That radical reaction gives us a white, sorry, RC carbanion R. And I probably shouldn't have, well, I probably should have redrawn that. Uh, just, just make a note that this is a trans configuration here. Uh, it's really a C R C C R negative charge there, and then there's still that there. So with this negative charge here, uh, what comes along next? Put it in green. Is ammonia, and I'm going to draw the hydrogen there, the N there, hydrogen hydrogen, whatever. We don't really care about the rest of it. Um, and being lone pairs, it's going to do, it's going to deprotonate it. So the next product that you get from this reaction is, I sincerely wonder how, uh, God damn, I drew it that way again. <laughs> I sincerely wonder how effective this reaction is because one, you're having to rely on the radical transformation of an, a very stable alkyne to a fucking radical. And two, the fact that you're literally going to create from this that. I mean, you know that that's a powerful fucking base. Anyways, so the, the next thing that essentially happens is, is very similar to this. We have more of this in the solution. Um, uh, another electron comes around. This is getting kind of messy does a half reaction with that to give us R C minus now that there's a two uh, lone pairs on that uh, carbon there and it's going to do the same uh, thing let me be sure that I draw that I added a hydrogen there another molecule of ammonia ammonia I'm sorry comes in and just like before, let me just steal that proton, giving me a blue. Anti configuration, anti addition there, and then a trans alkene. So, the, the, I again doubt that this is actually favorable or even a good reaction to run because one, it depends on this happening and you're getting two equivalents of amide in sodium. So anyways, uh, or the mechanism by which chromate can work to oxidize primary alcohols. Uh, So the primary alcohols we're going from, and just putting this up here, we're going from a primary ROH. We're going to go ahead and 
H2SO3, H2SO4, uh, H2O. We're going to oxidize this down to a carboxylic acid. So we're going to get a carboxylic acid. I'll redraw everything. No H there. We're going to get a carboxylic acid out of this reaction. So let's start off drawing the primary alcohol. OH. And then there's a there. So assuming chromium likes this, but we're going to put a lone pair of electrons. They're going to be attached to presumably an empty, not an empty electron orbital, but I don't know how that works. Anyways, and this is going to move down here. So moving there, knocking that out of place. Okay, and so the product of this reaction is RC. This hasn't changed. That hasn't changed. O, put that H there. It's a positively charged oxonium ion. CR, O, O, O. And this is completely different from what the UC Irving, Irving guy talked about, but it's, I mean, I gotta, I gotta do what I gotta do. So the next thing that we're going to have is an intramolecular uh, proton transfer reactions, where this lone pair here is going to be attracted to that hydrogen there, and that's going to put the lone pairs back on the hydrogen. Let's just make a note that this is a intramolecular proton transfer reaction, which are, are fast. Proton transfer reactions are always fast. So that gives us our next product, RCHHO, that's neutral charge, CRO, O, O, H what you got from there. And for whatever reason, doesn't really explain that in the book, but some, some things are gonna happen. So the first thing that happens, uh, green, remember we have water in this reaction mixture. That water is going to somehow by the grace of God, apparently water is a strong fucking base, and pull a proton off of a goddamn carbon. That's fucking stupid as hell. The, then the electrons here on this carbon are gonna jump to the oxygen. So yeah, and then again, we're going to be putting electrons on a transition metal. That's, I'm sure that's, you know, <laughs> that's gotta be fucking dynamically a good idea and that's going to knock this oxygen out of the place here so I, I, I sincerely fucking hate this so we, it's not only do we, like we have this coming here here uh, intramolecularly whatever that's fine but for water to fucking pluck a proton off a of carbon give me a fucking break anyways this is what the book says there's no way the book could ever be wrong what you get out of that is that reaction is going to give us a aldehyde. So we're going to have a aldehyde as a reaction. I'm just going to say INT as a reaction intermediate. I'm going to react with H2SO4 and water. And what that gives is something called a hydrate. So there's an O there, those are originally there, there's an H there, those are originally there, and I'm gonna draw it in blue. Blue to show why it's called a hydrate, because we've added water to it. This hydrate though is going to react with another chromate molecule. 
and very much in the same way that any other alcohol or the, the, the first alcohol did. Lone pairs goes here and this goes, sorry, wow, that goes there from the pi bond to the oxygen. Probably not the best of drawings, but who cares. Carbon there, hydrogen there, OH there, O plus hydrogen, CR, O, O, O minus. And what does this O minus do? Well, I mean, it does the same thing. So intramolecular SN2 reaction to deprotonate that. We need it with R, C, H, O, H, O, C, R, O, O. OH. And the next thing, again, fucking. Maybe I'm just an idiot, but something about drawing a diagram where fucking water plucks a proton off of an sp3 hybridized carbon just. I, I feel like the editors of my textbook really fucking dropped the ball on that. Anyways. It to, does pluck a proton off there. The electron goes here to the lone pair. And then again, we're putting electrons on a transition metal. It'll fly away. Uh, the end result of this, I'll do it in blue. The end result of this proton transfer reaction is, and hopefully I can show it, you, and you can see it. It's a carboxylic acid. That's what's important. Mechanism, I don't think that's that much. So. Anyway, I'm just gonna draw it like it would. So here's the carbon. There's an H there. That's the only one that we really care about. And an OH and a chromate. <laughs> so there's a lone pair on here. It does what it always does. This reaction is nothing new. C. There's an H there. I don't care about the rest of it. O. H. Positively charged there. Gives us a CR. O. 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 Minus formal charge. And just like before, we have a intramolecular SN2 reaction giving us C. The hydrogen there, neutral oxygen, Cr, O, 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 H. So, once again, this is, is just infuriating. It does the same stupid shit that we had to deal with last time of a water molecule magically plucking off a proton. I mean, I just, I don't know why that just... This does not make sense to me here. Anyway, so that double bond goes there. Um, and what's ironic is when it says that one of the lone pairs uh, on the oxygen is going to go to there, but it, it's, it's this bond is going to go there. Um, you could think of it as a lone pair, but at the end of the day, it, it's, it's going to keep it there. That's going to move that off there. Uh, chromate is going to go ahead and, and pull itself away. And what you get is a product in blue, in blue, is C, oh, sorry, there's no, ignore that, C, O, ketone, peroxy acid mechanisms, so, we're going from an alkene to a epoxide. And the mechanism that you need to know is it's kind of confusing. It happens a lot at once. But you have your general peroxy acid. And I'm going to exaggerate the fuck out of this to drive home my point. Oh. Oh. 
H. So on each of these, there's a lone pair. There's a lone pair there. So our alkene comes along and it sees that lone pair. And for whatever reason, it's fucking attracted to it somehow. So I'm going to think of these arrows like hands reaching out to grab that it's a hand reaching out to grab that oxygen but what it happens in reality is that it pulls it out there this pi barn starts to become a carbocation and that carbocation that's impending here it's attracted to that so it's going to go ahead and pull it back down to that meanwhile and here's the crazy part this pi bond senses that this is being attracted here and it's being pulled all in one step goes over here to deprotonate on that oxygen. That oxygen is going to send its, the bond between here is going to go to that oxygen there and this bond here goes there. This as extra spinach here stuff isn't that what really that what's that important. But what is important is that we have successfully gone from a uh, alkene to a epoxide. And that's a really a helpful reaction. And then with this one up here, we get a, I don't know if you can see, but it's a RCOOH. That becomes the OH. That becomes the double bonded there.